Welcome. My name is Shidesh Kapoor and this is episode six of Life Beyond Coronavirus, The Expert View. Now, COVID-19 has changed our world, leaving nothing and no one unaffected. However, it is not the first pandemic we have weathered and nor will it be the last. Or can it be the last? Today, we explore that possibility. Can we prevent the next pandemic? And if we can't prevent them all, how do we prepare for them? Any such option would require unprecedented cooperation between countries and governments and researchers and communities. Are we there yet? Well, it doesn't look like it. Can we get there? To discuss this and other topics, I'm joined by four world-leading experts from across the University of Melbourne. Nobel Prize-winning scientist Professor Peter Doherty is the patron of the Doherty Institute and author of Pandemics, What Everyone Needs to Know. Professor Brett Sutton is Victoria's Chief Health Officer as well as its Chief Human Biosecurity Officer and one of the illustrious alumni of the University of Melbourne. Professor Sharon Lewin is the inaugural director of the Peter Doherty Institute. She's an infectious diseases specialist and a basic scientist. And associate professor Tom Daly is the deputy director of the Melbourne School of Government and an expert in global governance. Well, if we are to prevent and prepare for pandemics, Peter, tell me one thing we must do to prevent the next pandemic. The, the absolutely basic thing is to keep our public health services strong and to help those countries who lack resources to have strong public health services and to make sure that this is operating at both the national and the global level. All right, Peter, you've, you've said it all, but Brett, let me turn to you. From a public health services perspective, what's the one thing that we must do? In the same way, I think we need to get the fundamentals right, the very uh, building blocks of public health response uh, that allows us to do surveillance well, to make sure that we've got the laboratory capacity and the human resources well, to respond. We'll come back to, to the fundamentals in a, in a moment. Sharon, from a doctor's and a basic scientist's point of view, what must we do well to prepare for the next pandemic? Well, we have to be prepared at all levels to activate our systems very quickly, um, both on data surveillance as well as, you know, clinical care and being prepared. It's All right, solution. and Tom, from a government or a governance expert point of view, what is the one thing we have to get right to prepare or prevent the next pandemic? Well, I think we really need to reinvigorate and reshape, if necessary, international cooperation. And in a sense, we have to face not only a biological disease, but political viruses of resurgent toxic nationalism, authoritarianism, and a sort right. of anti-truth. There we governance. go, so, so that's our menu today public health, getting the fundamentals right, being quick to react, and political viruses. Well, you've introduced a new term, but Peter, let me start with you. Uh, you were anticipating this. You wrote a book that, about pandemics and what everyone must know six years before it actually came about. Why were you anticipating this? Well, I'm a part of the influenza research community. That's um, one of my basic uh, clubs, if you like. And influenza is always the great um, threatening pandemic. So we're, we're in that group, we're very conscious of pandemics. And of course, if there's going to be a pandemic, the most likely form it will take is as a respiratory virus infection like influenza. And the reason for that is we can decide to modify other behaviours, but one thing we can't do is decide not to breathe. And so we're always a great threat from respiratory infections. And because of rapid international air travel, uh, viruses like influenza and COVID, as we've seen, get around the world very, very fast. Now, now, Peter, you anticipated this was going to be a virus. Now, there's all sorts of bugs. You know, there's bacteria, there's fungus. Why a virus? Why is a virus particularly dangerous? Because viruses are their own entity. They grow without in our living cells. So they're, they're partly foreign and they're almost partly us. And the bacterial diseases, uh, a bacterium is a cell in its own right. It has its own cell machinery. And it, it's generally the case that our broad spectrum antibiotics 
that we've developed for other bacteria will deal perfectly well with a novel bacterium. The one we worry about on the bacterial front is multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Again, because it's a respiratory infection and we, because we've pushed this so hard and we haven't been developing enough antibiotics to really specifically counter it. But it's the viruses we're really concerned about because with antiviral drugs, we have to de design them to be pretty specific for at least the class of viruses. So, so, so this is this combination. So because the virus is so much a part of us, it's hard to target. And because it's respiratory and linked to breathing, we can't do without it. That's why it's a respiratory virus, and you saw it coming. But you wrote a big book on this, Peter. What surprised you when it actually did come? Well, it's not a very big book, and it's a Q and A book, so it's a fairly accessible one. But it is a bit out of date. But what surprised me is that it actually happened. Because even though I've been talking about this for years, and we've all been talking about it, when it actually happens, it's quite a big shock. And uh, I thought I might escape it just through the natural process of time. So when it does ha <laughs> did happen, though I'd talked about the economic cost and uh, something about the social cost, I hadn't really understood what that meant. Now, someone who is more into governance and public health probably would have, but I'm a lab-based person. So I touched on these subjects, but the, the whole social context of it has gone way beyond what, what I you had anticipated. Well, it, all, that's a very good cue to turn to someone who has not only been thinking but preparing and preparing a state to deal with this. Um, was it a surprise to you, Brett? I think yes and no. Uh, clearly, pandemics come, they right. come in cycles. Uh, we tend to forget about them in between time. We have memories of goldfish, you know. SARS uh, was within our lifetimes. True. It could have been a pandemic. Uh, it wasn't, but it was only... Uh, because it was on a knife edge. Uh, we were fortunate in our response to it. Uh, but the uh, 2009 influenza pandemic, again, only uh, 11 years away, and yet we haven't really uh, taken the lessons necessarily about what we need to have in place right through. Uh, we do know that there are these fundamental building blocks that we need to have in terms of isolation, contact tracing, surveillance, uh, preparedness and practice. Uh, com communication and yeah. engagement. Uh, there are also differences between each pandemic and we need to learn through each one as well. But having those fundamental uh, building blocks in place, I think is the absolute starting point. Right. But also having the agility to manage something which is different. And COVID-19 was different because uh, f for flu pandemics, we've always assumed that there's no stopping them at the border. Right. There's an asymptomatic uh, transmission. Uh, you really can't uh, stop everyone uh, uh, from coming in. And, and you, you can't never keep, it. Yeah, and you can't keep closing your borders every winter. I mean, that would be very hard. Correct. But uh, with COVID-19, I think uh, we learned pretty quickly that uh, we have to treat it differently. There was uh, actually uh, some benefit in shutting down travel, shutting down entry into the country. That's not an assumption we would have gone into this pandemic with, point, uh, but right. we've learned. Well, it, 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 there's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? Because... Um, what you're pointing out is that SARS could have... The first SARS could have become a pandemic as big as this one. It didn't. It was a success. But therefore, it left no public memory in Australia. No one quite remembered that. Similarly, you were saying that, you know, the H1N1 and others, they could all have become big. But because we somehow averted them, they're not a part of the public memory. But this one... You know, anyone who's lived through this will not forget this for the rest of their lives. I hope they don't, because, yeah. you know, we've also had H7N9 out there on the horizon. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome is still there. Uh, H5N1 is still there. These are ones that we need to recognise could have all become pandemics. Well, Might still yet. You, now you're really scaring us. You're, you're getting our attention, particularly when you tell us all these H's and N's and, and things like that. But, but do you think in the inter-pandemic period, um, and I'm hoping that there will be an inter-pandemic period, um, do we need to change our lives fundamentally in some ways? I think so. I think we have to uh, recognise that the viruses uh, that are out there all of the time uh, will threaten us uh, in an ongoing sense. Um, we need to recognise where pandemics arise. Uh, they're often at the human-animal interface. We need to try and reduce the opportunities for crossover. Mm. Uh, you know, we learnt that with H7N9 when... Uh, a lot of the live chicken markets were shut down. That really reduced the risk 90, 95%. Mm. 
Uh, we need to think the same about wet markets. Mm. We need to think the same about our encroachment on uh, pristine environments where we mm. have interactions with viruses that we haven't in history. And, and what about physical distancing? Because, because one of the big non-pharmacological interventions this time really has been this physical distancing. We are sitting apart at some distance from each other. Yeah, and, and one of the things we learned is that even though we physical distanced for COVID, it's the influenza rates that have been going down. Hasn't, hasn't that been true? Absolutely. It happened in the Northern Hemisphere through this. Uh, it's happened in Australia. Really, influenza hit rock bottom after we physically distanced. So this winter? Board. This winter, uh, thus far, uh, it's, it's been reduced very, very significantly. Ah. At one and a half metres is an absolutely uh, critical thing to do for uh, most, if not all, respiratory viruses. Wow. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, it's hard for us, this generation, to look back and realise that there was a time when seat belts were seen as a huge encroachment upon a person's civil liberty. In fact, prior to that, uh, drinking and driving, it was thought to be a huge encroachment that the government asked anyone not to drink before they drove. Uh, and it was really the public interest in their interest. So I, I, would, I would want to hope that it doesn't become legislated that we have to be 1.5 <laughs> metres from all strangers. I think we'll learn. I think, you know, with an, an estimated 3,000 deaths from flu every year in Australia, it's a worthwhile intervention. It's a, it's a small sacrifice personally, uh, but if we can make it a, a habitual element of our lives, uh, it'll, it'll help everyone. Another habitual element, face masks. Maybe so. It's clearly uh, um, kind of embedded in East Asian uh, daily practice. I think we need to think about it more and more, uh, not just for those who are unwell, although that's mm. especially important, but maybe for everyone uh, as, a, as a routine through the height of a flu season, for example. Wow. Well, I hope someone's got different answers <laughs> for this. Maybe that is the right answer, but let me turn to you, Sharon. Um, now, you're at the Doherty Institute, which has been at the forefront of the science of this. Uh, you were the first people outside of China to actually uh, culture the virus. You've been leading on the development of medications and trials on that and vaccines uh, with partners in Australia and, and abroad. Um, what do you think science will need to do to prepare for and prevent the next pandemic? Well, one of the most important um, uh, aspects of preparing for a pandemic is early detection and surveillance. And um, I should just say that although China got a lot of criticism about the early response to coronavirus, they did identify that this was a coronavirus quite quickly um, through sophisticated um, um, approaches, basically looking, finding the genetic code mm. of the virus, which they announced on January the 10th. And, you know, I often reflect um, of what, how soon we would have started sequencing um, the sputum of someone that, in, who, in whom there was an unknown cause of pneumonia. So we do need really sophisticated and far better early surveillance and detection systems using scientific advances like genetic sequencing. And they need to actually be available in multiple places. In many ways, we were sort of fortunate that this happened in China and they did this. I mean, it had this first case appeared in Pakistan or mm. Indonesia. Mm. You know, the thought of sequencing viruses would have been unheard of. So really good science is needed for um, rapid detection and surveillance and identification. And then, of course, our solutions to this, if we can't block... I mean, prevention is always best, and if we can block the spread, it's the most important thing. But ultimately, the solutions are going to be drugs or vaccines. And I think a key component of that is a highly skilled workforce, that we need to be able to develop those things quickly. And we also need partnerships with industry because drugs and vaccines come from industry. And we might actually even need a different model for how we, you know, develop these things and perhaps be less reliant on the private sector. Right. But they, we'll, we'll, there's lots of things you've put on there and I think we'll, we'll probably need all of them in some measure. But let me come to the first. This genetic testing of viruses is relatively new, is it not? Yeah. I mean, do we, gen, the genetic code of the virus, I mean, we're using this more and more, genomics we call it, we use it more and more in investigation of outbreaks, traditionally actually in in um, superbugs and drug-resistant bacteria, how we trace transmission of these bugs in hospitals, for example. Mm. We now use genomics quite quickly and it can give you very precise um, uh, identification of which, who, which, who, which 
two people share the same organism. Right. So we use it for tracking outbreaks. But for diagnosis, if you don't know what's happening in someone, there are now new ways that you can identify novel viruses through genomic sequencing. And we probably need to bring that earlier into clinical practice. But, but you also spoke about a network, because this is something that can arise anywhere. So it wouldn't be very good if we had it in Melbourne, but not almost as a network across the country. Absolutely, absolutely. Network. Well, within Australia, we, are, we do have quite good networks for this. We have um, sophisticated laboratories, which we call public health reference labs. They're supported by our state governments and federal government. They do the sort of fancy testing for microbiology. And most countries ha rely on their reference laboratories and different countries will have different numbers of those. But I th worry that um, countries in, especially low and middle income countries, you know, need that capacity too. And, mm. and, and you, physicians at the front line need to be thinking, if I don't understand what's going on, could this be something new? And of course, you know, this happens infrequently, but then we need a really well-oiled detection system for a people to think about it and know how to get that sort of testing. Which goes across a nation, but then also between nations, as you were saying. So it, it just, this is not just altruism. It is in our interest then that the labs in Pakistan and, and you know, elsewhere be pretty much as sensitive as labs here so that, so that we can all pick them up. But of course, that requires governments to cooperate. Um, Tom, what have we learned from what has happened about how governments have reacted and cooperated in the context of COVID? I mean, it's, it's been interesting in that we have, we're living in a world where multilateralism has been under threat and challenge for quite a few years now in, in a way that it hasn't been for decades. You know, we've had uh, the likes of the US and Philippine governments attacking the UN. We have Russia and the US saying they're going to defund certain international institutions. We have in the EU, Hungary demonizing the EU and so on. Um, but in terms of the pandemic, what it's shown is that the majority of the world states are still able to come together and cooperate. So we saw that, for example, where um, the US government started attacking the WHO, um, refused to sort of join this global initiative to, um, to, to find a vaccine, um, and, and refused to join the call of 122 states calling for an investigation and a review of the global uh, pandemic response. Um, and and the attacks involved, you know, suspending US funding to the WHO, which is a huge contributor, um, involved um, this threatening letter uh, tweeted out to the world that Trump had sent to the WHO saying, you'd better improve yourself. Also saying in other public fora that the WHO doesn't serve America's interests or has a China bias. Um, and that was actually met at the World Health Assembly in May by a range of states, especially um, uh, the Chinese government and uh, the EU, uh, producing a statement largely drafted by EU diplomats saying, look, um, the WHO is important and sort of um, the EU diplomats in particular clearly saw and I agree with them that the uh, Trump attacks on the WHO but, but, were intimately but, but Tom, tied what, to his re-election What re you're drawing is, is, is not a very comforting picture. This is a picture of schoolboy squabbles. You know, they're, fi they're fighting with this, don't like this. This doesn't give me comfort that, you know, all the governments are cooperating mm. in, in a way that could prevent a pandemic. Absolutely, and I think what's most worrying is that we have key countries, including one of the superpowers, acting sort of irrationally and also having experienced serious failures with their pandemic responses. So the US, the UK, um, Brazil, India, Russia have all experienced yes. serious failures. Um, and, you know, three of those... Uh, the UK, um, Brazil and the US are in the 40,000 and up death club. Nobody wants to be in that club. And what that means is that that has really harmed the reputations of those states and the, even their capacity to forge multilateral co cooperation, both globally and regionally. And that's a really, really difficult well, situation. And, to and maybe that's where the middle powers come in. <laughs> You know, um, I think largely through planning, but a combination of planning and geography and maybe a bit of luck put together, some of the middle countries have done very well, and we're, of course, one amongst them. And I think what we need to explore is that do we have a role in, prepare, in helping the world prepare for and prevent 
the next pandemic. But that, of course, takes us back to how these things originate in the first place. So, Peter, could I turn to you? You've studied viruses and you know how these things jump from one species to the other. Can you help us understand where you think uh, this COVID came from? Oh, I think it's very likely that, um, as with the SARS virus and the Middle Eastern virus, it's come from bats. Uh, there's pretty good uh, evidence that bats maintain a lot of these coronaviruses and uh, that they have a, their immune system, though they're mammals like us, is emphasising a different part of immunity, which allows them to have persistent infections with these things. And so they're, they're a primary risk in a situation where you have uh, the possibility of transmission to other wild animals in the environment, and then you have a situation where those animals are being sold in uh, live wet markets. So, so Peter, in, could in I just sit. clarify one thing you said? You, you said they have an immune system that allows them to have persistent infections. That's not a very good immune system, is it? I thought the purpose of uh, the immune system was to get rid of infections. It, it is and it isn't. Uh, it, we, we adapt to various viruses and they adapt to us. And it seems the adaption that the bat has taken is that by not having a big immune response against these things and having viruses that don't do them a whole lot of damage in their own right, that uh, they, they find it OK to live with them a lot more than we do. We live with some viruses. We live with the herpes viruses, for instance. Uh, they can break out in older age or right, when our immune right, system right. fails, but we live with them. That, now, that's a good example. Now, I, I was reading somewhere uh, that one group has identified 781 such viruses in bats already, and they estimate there is another 1,000 to go. So they estimate there are something like 1,700 of these yet unidentified viruses in bats, and any one of them could become a pandemic. Is that right? It's, it's possible, and I think what we should do is really study those viruses in bats. Find what groups of viruses are active. We know there's a lot of coronaviruses. And it, it's the case with antiviral drugs, like the anti-influenza drugs. They work across all the influenza viruses, not just novel ones. And I think we should be making drugs against these different classes of virus. Just have them ready and ready to go if we actually need them. And we can scale them up very rapidly. If we'd done that with uh, SARS-1, we might have been in better shape with this new with virus. SARS-2. All right, so that's going right to where the host is. But tell us why they transfer from the bats. Why do you think this one transferred and why don't they transfer all the time? Uh, they may do. Uh, there's a great deal of randomness in all this. That's the way nature is. That's the way evolution is and so forth. So uh, it may have just happened to jump into another species that happened, for instance, to be sold at a, a live at a wet market in Wuhan. That's a likely scenario. It's not absolutely proven. But that's how the first SARS virus came out. It jumped into a little animal, I think the Himalayan civet cat, which was being sold at a live animal market in a big city and uh, got across into people. It may have been doing this for many years, but there's also another strange phenomenon called the super spreader, where some humans spread these viruses very, very effectively. And we think super spreaders particularly were very important in the initial SARS right. outbreak, which right. just happened at the time of Chinese New Year, when it just happens that everyone's traveling. So it's a lot of happenings together that right. all come together right. to create a catastrophe. But, but one thing that seems to be happening over and over again is this issue of live markets. Can you say why live is that important? I mean, what happens between a live market and our grocery markets? What's the big difference? Well, our chickens, for instance, tend to be in plastic if you go to the, uh, <laughs> yes. to the supermarket. But um, in, in Asia particularly, uh, perhaps because there hasn't been a lot of refrigeration traditionally, and because this is a traditional type of practice anyway, the chickens are brought in live and sold in live bird markets. Now, that's where a lot of the influenza jump occurs, because you have a lot of birds together, you have different types of birds, and so it can transmit to, from one bird to another, and you have a lot of people together. And that's been a big risk factor with flu. And that's why uh, when we have 
uh, threats of influenza pandemics or jumps across, uh, the live bird markets are the first things that need to be closed down. And these live animal markets are also an issue. But the problem, of course, is these are deeply embedded in culture and they're valued in particular cultures. And it's extremely difficult to change embedded cultural practices. practices. We all understand that. And, and of course, Peter, you've been thinking a lot about this. And before the pandemic, um, we had several conversations where you talked about how climate change and, and the other change that was happening around the world was going to interact with, with pandemics. Tell us how that's working out. The, the main issue with climate change as the world warms is that those viruses that spread in warmer environments will move further away from the equator. That's particularly the insect-borne viruses, and it's also uh, conditions like malaria, which is mosquito-borne. Otherwise, uh, with respiratory virus infections, it's not necessarily the case that warmer weather would increase risk. In fact, it might even decrease it a little bit. And uh, we, we will, uh, do, I hope we won't do this experiment, but we seem to be doing it rather aggressively. Uh, there are some experiments we shouldn't do, and one is warming up the planet unnecessarily. <laughs> That's right. There's no going back if we do that. Um, but I think one thing that has to be said, uh, that in responding to all of this, um, Australia's done a good job. Uh, good job really across the country and good job in our state. And, and really the role that people like you, uh, Brett and Brendan Murphy, who we've all come to know, have played has been very pivotal. Did you see this coming, this partnership with politicians? Not, not in the way that it's turned out, I guess. Um, it's clear that National Cabinet was formed uh, yeah. to, to create unprecedented cooperation across states and territories. Uh, but AHPPC, the committee that uh, I'm a member of as Chief Health Officer, where all the Chief uh, um, Preventive and Chief Health Officers came together uh, under uh, the Chief Medical Officer's leadership. So this is relatively new. This wasn't happening all the time. Well, it's always been around. HPPC has been around for a long time. But as a directly advising body to a national cabinet, right. that is absolutely new. And it really put uh, scientific advice... Uh, public health advice uh, direct into government uh, policy making. And I, I think that's a critical uh, uh, point to make about how we've responded here. I, in some countries, it was only a matter of a couple of weeks yes. too slow in responding yes. that's made the difference of 40,000 deaths. Yes. So I think uh, having that very close embedded relationship uh, is a really critical one. But it has it... actually happened before, I should add. Um, Australia's got a track record of doing this quite well. That's right. And it's certainly with HIV. So, you know... And that's something you know well, yes. Well, now 40 years ago, you know, Australia's response to HIV is um, lauded as one of the best because of partnerships between science, community and leadership. Hmm. And from the very early days, back in the early 80s, as an example where harm reduction or access to clean needles was really unheard of as a... Um, or very abhorrent to many um, people who didn't understand what that harm reduction meant. Um, in Australia, that was introduced due to political um, understanding of the science. So if you give people clean needles, they won't spread HIV. So we have virtually no HIV in people who and, and it's drugs. important to recognise that for a politician to be selling that to a community at that time... Exactly. And ..was a hard thing I, And to also do. another thing that, um, that you know, characterised Australia's early response was bipartisan support. And, in fact, across the entire history of HIV, both left and right sides of government have supported these science-based um, policy, as well as a key thing of the response was this partnership with community. Maybe we haven't done that as well here. Um, different, there are different demands on, on community partnerships in a pandemic <laughs> where you've got to move quickly and tell people not to do. But, actually, you know, a lot of our response this time... Um, is re uh, I mean, I wasn't around in the early 80s, I should say. I was a medical student. But, um, but you know, it really is quite similar of science-informing policy. And also what, what resonates very much with me is that didn't happen in the US. The US had a very different outbreak e of even, HIV. Even in the days even of AIDS? Even then, yeah. Ronald Reagan was the, the president at the time. He never said the word HIV. There was no community um, partnerships formed early on. Of course, that happened later. There was no access to clean needles, as there mm. still isn't. Huge outbreaks in people who inject drugs. But what the US did was they brought this fabulous science of investment in antivirals and vaccines. And I see this repeated now, but I look at it thinking, 
really, you know, you should be focusing on public health and That's prevention. right. So what they this can't is... do through, through the community, they throw money at. Exactly. But in, and... at some level, you're saying that the sorts of things we are seeing this time is actually a replica of how they've responded in, in the past. Yeah, public health, the US um, uh, tends to do... You know, you know, there's lots of fantastic things about the US scientific system. There's lots of fantastic things about the US Pub, uh, the US response to emerging infectious diseases and they've done some great things internationally but in their own backyard this has happened before you know HIV was really poorly managed in the early days of HIV. Well it, it seems the our backyard then pulls together reasonably well uh, but in times of emergencies so how do we keep this partnership going if, if uh, essentially the lesson is that we can't just pack this pandemic and then you know, wait till the next one comes around. We'll have to change ways in our community. We'll have to change the ways in our science and public health. How do we keep that public interest and investment alive in the lean period, so to say, or the good periods? I hope we do have proper reflections on what's worked here and what hasn't worked here. We've got ongoing threats. Uh, the threat of pandemics will continue, uh, but... Uh, there are other existential threats, antimicrobial resistance, fungal resistance um, and, and climate change will all be significant and potentially existential threats to health. And so putting science, putting public health thinking uh, into the heart of decision making, I think is a really worthwhile reflection for us all to have so that we can uh, step up to these because it is early, integrated, coordinated, intensive action uh, that's required in, in managing them. You, you call these existential threats, uh, Brett, but I think, uh, you know, last November, if one would have said those things, people would have yawned. You know, they would have said, oh, yeah, you know, these experts go on and on, everything's an existential threat. Um, I, I think this will leave a deep and enduring impression on us, on our economy, uh, in our communities. But the issue is how to harness that for good. Um, so from a public health point of view, from the way public health should be structured once we are over this acute period, do you have any sense of where it should go? Because it usually tended to sort of drift into the background. It does. We're in the, we're in the business of making stuff not happen. We avoid catastrophes. We try and stop epidemics. We try and stop uh, the kind of terrible outcomes from uh, the hazards and risks that exist uh, to human health. And so it's always a challenge to make ourselves visible but I think we need to keep banging that drum to say uh, the importance of public health isn't only uh, at the times of emergency, it's in having uh, the, the appropriate resource and the appropriate focus and investment right through. And as Sharon said, the investment in people so that um, uh, you can't just throw money at it at in a moment. moment. Yes. You have to have the expertise, the capacity and the capability uh, to have been built over time. That's a very good point you raise. So in other words, if we did not have the modelers and the mathematicians and the scientists and the virologists all there, we couldn't have trained them in, in three weeks that, that they were needed. Now, of course, you've been anticipating that to some extent. Uh, Sharon, you've built the Doherty Institute in the name of our patron, Peter Doherty, uh, and you brought together different groups. So tell us what was in your thinking before this pandemic came about in bringing the expertise together? Yeah, well, the Doherty Institute is certainly well-placed, um, was, you know, really designed to have a, to respond to this sort of event, um, meaning that you need a deeply skilled workforce, you know, um, virology, mo modelling, all the things you talked about. This comes off a deep understanding of these disciplines um, and ability to work across disciplines and also, again, deep partnerships with government. You know, a lot of this work had... We'd had a bit of a dry run with influenza, so a lot of the models, for example, that Jodie McVernon and her team developed were all framed around influenza. They had been working over 10 years with state and federal governments on pandemic planning and modelling outbreaks. And so then when this comes along... I heard someone say this recently, that it's much easier to pivot than to, you know, design something fresh. True. Same thing with the virologist. So the skill in isolating a virus or understanding testing algorithms or designing antiviral drugs, it comes off a base of deep understanding of all, you know, vi not only just viruses, but RNA viruses, for example. But, but help us understand how the Doherty Institute is then different. You know, most of us, we've been in universities, we know there is a department of this and a department of this. Um, how is the Doherty different from just a department of 
microbiology and virology? Yeah, well, I think the actual key difference and brilliance in the concept, and of course it wasn't me, I joined as the director um, when the building was up. This all predated me, largely led by Jim McCluskey, Mike Catton and others, um, was bringing research, education and public health together. And what we have at the Doherty is public health diagnostic laboratories that are working hand in hand with Brett every day because they're doing the actual diagnosis and detection of um, new viruses or now coronavirus right next door to the people that are embedded in the deep research, mm. education, loads of fantastic bright students ready, you know, at the ready to jump into this and also our clinicians. So I think that's the key difference. And many states are actually looking at what we have in Victoria you know, really sort of quite envious of that capability. And what that gives you is not just the deep breadth and understanding, but the ability to surge and, and really redirect workforce. If I look across our researchers, um, of course, as you know well, and um, many may not know, all research stopped during this pandemic. So yes. people that were running cancer immunology labs, my own HIV lab, um, influenza laboratories, they all stopped. Um, but we were able to mobilise a lot of that brilliance to, right. to this problem. Uh, so we have immunologists that have traditionally worked on mice and now, you know, embedded in the, trying to do COVID vaccines. Because, and I was actually impressed. Just give me a sense, because I know the early days around January 26th, within a period of a week or two, tell me about the scaling up of testing that you were able to do. You went from almost doing 100 tests to how many a day? That's exactly right. So in the virus detection laboratory, which is run by Julian Druce and Mike Catton with Invidral, the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory, part of the Doherty, one of these pu very important public health labs funded by the state and federal governments, um, they would routinely do 100 sort of yeah. tests a day um, because they, they're detecting all sorts of... They're measuring and quantifying all sorts of viruses that we use day-to-day -day medicine, whether right. it's HIV, hepatitis, CMV, a range of others. Um, and so they, this was the lab that designed the new coronavirus test. We were already evaluating it in early January, shared it with other similar laboratories in other states around late January, and then, of course, we're at the ready to d diagnose the first case on the 24th of January. They would routinely be doing 100 a day and at, at peak time they went up to about 3,000 tests wow. a day. And by um, some late February, we were doing more tests per 100,000 population within that one laboratory at the Doherty in the entire United States. The United States. And one thing, Brett mentioned that, you know, a week or two make a difference. Well, there was probably about a six-week delay of getting testing up and running in the US they really only had testing running by early March. So we were able to do this quickly. I just another quick comment was at one point in that, in that time, um, you know, the, the, the work was significant. We put a call out across the Institute. We have about 700 people at the Institute for any PhD students or junior scientists that may want to assist with the testing. It's, it's technical, but it's not super sophisticated. A PhD student could be trained quite easily. We had about 60 people mobilised within two days that could go <clears throat> and assist. All right, you, you've made a very good case of how, in this instance, we can't learn from the US, but we could actually take a lot of lessons away from what we, as a reasonably small country, have been able to do very successfully. So, Tom, I now turn to you to the issue that you raised about, you know, if the superpowers aren't going to do it, maybe the middle powers need to take a lead, because you're quite right. You listed that the world's big countries have spectacularly failed. Maybe they failed because they were too big. And, and the ones that one can look to for success, Australia is one of them, New Zealand's another one, South Korea, in a Taiwan, mm. and some of the smaller European countries have, have done well. So Vietnam's done very well. We, we, what a wonderful mm. example that is, with, with a low and middle-income country using Germany? simple measures, fundamentals. Germany, with a and reasonable size population. Yes. Yeah, the that would power. probably be a good mid-sized example. Yeah. So, what could we do now to prepare the world for this? Well, first of all, 
I would say it's not so much about size as about the nature of governance, because in so many of the states that have had a really bad response, what's been at the root of that failure has been the inability to see some issues as actually transcending politics, transcending party politics. And what's happened then is that the response has been subservient to political needs, whether that's in Russia, whether that's in the US, and it's been rolled into this partisan contestation. And that's been in the sort of um, pattern where the idea of objective knowledge, objective institutions themselves have been under increasing questioning. And that's all very problematic. And I think that's where the likes of Australia have actually been managed to have a much more effective response because we do have a lot of partisanship, but they managed to, to transcend that. Hmm. Um, and that's really important because that's been at the root of the effective response in South Korea, in Australia, in New Zealand, in my home country of Ireland. Yeah. Um, and, and that really is going to be at the root of, I think, where middle powers like Germany, like Australia, and smaller countries can band together and sort of show there is a way to effectively um, deal with um, any future pandemic or this pandemic um, democratically and, and in a way that That's sort true. of has the least possible impact. All right, so if Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and, and he's, you know, a lot of credit to our politicians. I mean, one has to say that Australia wasn't known to be the place for you know, the paradigm of political harmony. Uh, but in this case, absolutely it has. And, and credit needs to go to them because the truth of the matter, and Brett, you said this well, when it comes to scientific calibre and quality, it would be fair to say that there are equally bright people in the UK mm -hmm. and the US who, could, who were probably advising their politicians. Their politicians probably were not listening to them, and that's a complex sociological question. But then I think it would be fair to say also that Australia, and I'm Prime Minister has taken a lead uh, in pointing out the issue that we must scientifically investigate where the virus came from. And that was a difficult lead to take because he got a lot of heat for it and will probably suffer the consequence of it. But that was a, a task of leadership. So if Scott Morrison was to call you now and say, what's the next task of leadership for Australia in this case, what would that be? One of them for me would be just to say we need to look at pandemic preparedness not as a sort of luxury and international cooperation, not just as a luxury that we might not be able to afford when we have so many domestic challenges facing us, especially coming out of the, mm -hmm. the, the current phase of the, uh, the pandemic, but that is a basic necessity. But also in terms of if we are going to continue to have effective responses and be prepared for the next pandemic, we have to thicken up the institutions that actually are mediating our deliberation, not just having good technical preparedness, but having a lot of sort of um, knowledge institutions, as we call them, in place to make sure that we have, we don't just get locked in partisan contestation. So, so, so is this the WHO? Um, so the WHO on the international level, at the domestic level, the likes of, you know, uh, the public broadcaster, ABC, that's why the cuts are so sort of concerning to hear about today. The universities, um, you know, these sites that are outside of the realm of parts and contestation in many ways and provide some sort of location for objective expertise. Well, you know, but Tom, I, I love what you're saying. I'm a professor at a university. Why wouldn't I love what you're saying? But people say, no, you know, you're, you're just sort of padding your own here. Um, could there be another way? Or is, are these public institutions the way to go? I think we really haven't come up with any other model, let's put it that way, okay. that, that works in terms of a democratic state that is capable of acting effectively uh, in terms of multilaterally, um, that is capable of being prepared across multiple sort of crisis possibilities. Um, uh, without those kinds of institutions because, you know, it's not just about the technical capacity, it's about next time around, are we going to be in a more hyper-partisan situation or a better political context where it doesn't require a crisis of this magnitude mm. to sort of work together and have more bipartisan action? I mean, you know, as I hear all of what all of you have been saying, this is a magnitude of response that is required across so many sectors you know, this could just become a very... It, it's like, it'll be like having another military. Mm. You know, you're the chief human biosecurity officer. Do you think that we'll need health defence forces in nations pretty much of the magnitude of the, you know, the military defence forces? 
I, I think it's not an unreasonable way to look at it. Whether they are kind of on standby and, and repurposed uh, between pandemics, or whether they're putting their minds and hearts to public health more broadly, mm -hmm. I, I think they're a really valuable resource. We, should, we shouldn't um, set aside the fact that public health has delivered half of the mortality yes. gains yes. Uh, in our lifetimes. And so whether or not it's just responding to pandemics, public health has a critical role to play, uh, you know, with um, the harms of smoking, the harms of alcohol, the harms of gambling, the harms of uh, um, uh, illicit drugs. So we have to bear in mind that there's a, a really good economic investment in public health regardless. And so having that workforce and, and as I say, whether they're ready to surge from some other mm -hmm. area or whether they're embedded in our public health work every day, I think it's useful to make sure that they're networked uh, and multi-skilled and have a, a, a genuine long-term uh, mm -hmm. investment in them uh, so that they're ready to Good go. To Right, Peter, on, on that note, as we are wrapping up, um, if Scott Morrison did call, and he called you, uh, what would you tell him? What should we do um, to make sure that we're better prepared or prevent, and also for Australia to play its leading role? I think that uh, Scott Morrison is being extremely well advised by the Chief Medical Officer and by the various committees that, um, that advise the chief medical officer. And that receives advice from our people and from other people in similar institutions across the country. So I would say, uh, listen to them. Um, I, I don't have specific advice for the prime minister. I think he's done extremely well with this. Of course, we all realize that the most difficult part is, is what's happening now. How do we come out of it? So I would say congratulations to our particular, uh, to our political leaders including the Prime Minister, of course. Indeed. Well, um, so it seems in some ways that the experts are rehabilitated, or at least <laughs> the experts are saying the experts <laughs> are rehabilitated. That's a bit self-serving, I should point out. No, but I think it, it would have to be said that a year ago, um, uh, you, know, you know, in much of the Western world, the experts were sort of reviled. You know, they said, ah, oh, people would yawn and say, ah, oh, you know, experts always go on about what they like. Um, so perhaps there is a rehabilitation of this. Now, you've got to play your hand right uh, and essentially engage in, in what is of greatest importance uh, to, to the community. But let me leave the experts part of you aside and ask you a slightly different question. Because after all, COVID in our own lives is, is not just a technical scientific matter. It is something that personally changed our lives and perhaps the trajectory of our lives going forward. And a lot about what has happened is disruptive and difficult. But I'm trying to look for the positives. So let me ask you that as you look at what has happened, what do you think will be the positive lasting legacy of this otherwise disaster? So let me start with you, Peter, as what have you seen in us as individuals or as a community of the world that gives you hope uh, out of COVID? I would hope to think that it would uh, cause politicians and the people in general uh, and some of the media barons to value expertise and to listen to what they're saying. Uh, again, about the main threat we face, which is in the long term much worse than COVID, and that is, of course, climate change. We need to uh, value that expertise at the same level we value our medical expertise and readjust what we're doing to fit with what they are telling us, because this is an extremely dangerous. That, that's a good point you raise. I mean, look at how amazingly society has adapted to the advice given by experts. And in fact, the advice given on climate change would have required a much lesser change in our behaviours, but we were all collectively sort of resistant to it. So, all right, so you're hoping that this experience of having listened to advice and saved our lives will make people more amenable to listening to advice. I hope you're right there, Peter. Brett, from your point of view, what do you think will be the lasting positive legacy? Well, I have to agree with Peter. I would also say that um, pandemics, like many challenges to human health, uh, bring out the, the terrible issues of inequity. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen uh, ethnic minorities uh, with worse health outcomes. We've seen uh, um, people of colour in the United States and mm -hmm. indigenous people mm -hmm. across the world uh, suffer uh, extremely disproportionately. We need to address equity issues all of the time, uh, not just in pandemics, uh, so that we can learn the lesson mm. of um, what 
the disparities in health mm. do uh, throughout human history. Mm. I, I think that's a good lesson, though. Can I add a slightly positive note to that very good caution and lesson is that I think this time around in Australia, the indigenous outcomes have been heartening. Mm. They've and been I think, terrific. They've I, been and I think the biggest credit should go to our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters Absolutely. because I think they took charge of it. They worked with government. They worked with their own scientific advice. And, and I think that's heartening because this is one example, perhaps against the 100 counter examples, uh, where we've come out uh, well. Sharon, what gives you hope? Um, what gives me hope? Well, I, 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 I hope that our um, success does not lead to greater isolation. And uh, what gives yeah. me hope is, meaning isolation for the world, you know, that this, a lot of countries have looked inward to address their yes. pandemic, which I guess you have to do in the initial phase. But I think it's a sharp reminder that we are incredibly interconnected. And so Australia, as a, um, as a wonderful example for what's happened in the region, needs to partner and make sure that we're really well connected and aligned with um, other countries, you know, rich or poor, that are in our neighbourhood. And I, I haven't quite seen... I'm hoping that that's going to be our next oh, phase, actually. That's a good point. Yeah. So you, in some sense, this has exposed our interconnectedness mm. and you're hoping that we don't learn the wrong lesson from it, mm. which is close your doors. Yes, exactly, and, for, and, and that isolation's good. I that isolation's good. <laughs> like, you know, serious isolation. <laughs> no, you know, no one landing here for months and months yes, and months. Yes. Um, but I do, I think it's a reminder that this could happen anywhere and we will only be able to respond to it if we're, you know, we're in interconnected. And one area that the Austra Australia could do an opportunity is, is you know, form a line, you know, much stronger stronger alliances in pandemic preparedness across the region. That's right. Which we, we don't really have at the so moment. So that's the other hope where we could lead and, and perhaps have an example. Tom, where do you find hope in all of this? One of the biggest sources of hope for me is the way the pandemic has absolutely skewered the notion that authoritarian states are more effective and more efficient at dealing with crises and governance in general, you know, being able to mobilise the state. Um, what we've seen is that both democracies and authoritarian states ah. have done well and have done badly. And so if you want to have effectiveness, why not choose freedom along with it? Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> alongside that, for me, history shows us that we should have hope because, you know, 50 years ago with the 1968 Hong Kong flu, in a much more fragmented geopolitical space with the Cold War and, China, you know, the People's Republic not even recognised by the UN and the US, they still managed to cooperate internationally and using the WHO to deal with that pandemic. So, and there, there was a lingering memory of 1918 that sort of is seen as having having promoted cooperation. So maybe, maybe just maybe, we'll see that happen. This well, time this is the too. time for hope. So you're saying the hope here is that despite the political fractionation that might come, we might still be able to pull together as humanity on the issues of health. Yes, we don't have to really be globally singing across the balconies to one another, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we can see that it's in well, our own self We can do that on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, of, all of us are doing that on Zoom. Zoom brought us together, so look. Yeah. Thank you all. And with that, I think it is sadly time to bring this discussion to a close. Please join me in thanking our wonderful experts. And with this episode, we also bring our six-part series to a close. It has been a privilege and a really enjoyable experience for me to speak to world-leading experts on life beyond COVID. When we started this series, we had no idea how many of you would be interested. We've been delighted that hundreds and thousands of you from all over the world have joined us. And our program has benefited from your questions and your curiosity. So thank you. And if you missed an episode or would like to return to one, you can see them all on Pursuit, which is the University of Melbourne's media platform. And you'll see the link for it here. And I would like to thank the wonderful team at the University of Melbourne, as well as the production team here at ABC Melbourne. Keep safe, stay well, until we can shake hands again and namaste to all of you.